Good morning, everyone. My name is Andy Field. I'm the director of the City of San Diego Parks and Recreation Department. Thank you today for joining us for our Multiple Species Conservation Program workshop. We're really glad to have you here. And of course, happy Friday. I want to start off by giving you some uh, basic tips for our webinar today. As this is a webinar-based form, all participants are muted except for the presenter at the time of the presentation. If you have any questions regarding any of the presentations that you see today, please email uh, Tara Ash Reynolds at the email that's provided in your registration. Include the name of the presenter in which you have a question and your email will be forwarded for a response. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. I first want to uh, state that as of 2019, the city of San Diego has reached 97% of the overall conservation goals for the city's multiple species conservation program sub area. In 2019, 157 acres were added to the multiple habitat planning area. This, the, our city has six natural resource management plans, NRMPs, that are currently in process. Mission Trails was approved in 2019 with five others that are projected to be completed uh, by 2021. And there's a brochure that you should have received as part of your uh, package that includes that detail. Tecolote Canyon Natural Park, Pacific Highlands Ranch Open Space, Otay Valley Regional Park, Crest Canyon Open Space, and the Lusardi Lozanja Canyons. 2019 marked year one of our Vernal Pool HCP permit, and the city produced the initial Vernal Pool Management and Monitoring Summary report under the Vernal Pool Habitat Conservation Program. One of the wettest years in our history was in, was in 2019, which was evident in our rare plant monitoring effort where we recorded exponential increases over previous drought years. Invasive species continue to be an issue throughout our preserves. Even with the good rain year comes a great deal of weeds that come through. So keeping up with the invasive weed control is always a challenge along with transients and fires. We implemented a new digital survey platform that has revolutionized our field data collection. In 2019, we had 700 visitors to Tecolote Canyon Family Day and over 100,000 visitors to Mission Trails Visitor Center. And as you may have noticed during the coronavirus pandemic, we have also seen quite a flocking of people to our open spaces. In 2019, we've had a huge volunteer effort with over 27,000 hours of volunteer effort throughout the preserves. And then we collected and removed over 714 tons of trash and debris and 140 tons of invasive plants. Several city departments contribute to the overall implementation of the city's multiple species conservation program. I'd like to acknowledge the Parks and Recreation Department, Planning Department, Public Utilities Department, Engineering and Capital Projects Department, Transportation and Stormwater Department, in the city of San Diego for their efforts in getting us uh, some of these numbers. And a special shout out today to Sarah Allen, Mark Berninger, Jason Allen, Christy Forberger, Dan Monroe, Tara Ash Reynolds for making this year's MSCP workshop come together during this unprecedented time. So why don't we go ahead and get started with our presentation to, presentations today. We have a very full agenda and we're very excited to show all this for you today. So let's go ahead and get started with our very first presenter. And that is uh, Beth Principe with the County Parks Department. So Beth, why don't you go ahead and take it away? Thank you. Thank you. So good morning, I'm Bethany Principe and I am a biologist with the County of San Diego Department of Parks and Rec and I work on the implementation of the MSCP South County sub area plan. Uh, before I begin, I would just like to take a moment and thank the city of San Diego for hosting the MSCP workshop in these incredible times that we are living. It, um, it took a lot of flexibility to be able to put on the workshop and we really appreciate that you guys took the effort to do that. Uh, today I'll be presenting on the County of San Diego's MSCP South County sub area plans 2019 annual report, which is our 22nd annual report. Please next slide. 
Now, I know that most of us here already are familiar with the history of the MSCP, but I would feel bad if I didn't at least give a little overview. So um, here we go for a quick refresher. The MSCP for the County of San Diego is found within the unincorporated areas of the county. The MSCP South County sub-area plan was adopted in 1997. The, the North County plan is currently in draft form and the uh, East County plan has been proposed. The cities of Chula Vista and San Diego have their own MSCB sub-area plans within their city's boundaries. Next slide, please. The County of San Diego is focused on ensuring that the preserve being assembled for the MSCP meets the functional intent of the plan and completes linkages and wildlife corridors. The blue areas on the map are lands that were conserved prior to the sub-area plan's adoption in 1997. The green areas on the map are the areas that have been conserved since 1998. As of December 31st, 2019, the county and our partners have assembled, have preserved 79,188 acres of habitat, and the preserve assemblage has reached 80% of the preservation goals in the first 22 years of the 50-year plan. Next slide, please. In 2019, county acquisitions added 567 acres to the South County sub-area plans preserve and raised the total acreage of county-owned open space within the sub-area plan to over 13,000 acres. 2019 county acquisitions included additions to Ramona Grasslands, Dictionary Hill, Sycamore Canyon, Good and Ranch preserves, as well as the creation of the Skyline Preserve and Iron Mountain Preserve. Federal, state, and private land dedication from development projects also increased the preserve size. Next slide, please. So DPR has over 30 parks and open space properties in the South County sub-area plan. Resource management plans or RMPs guide DPR staff for managing and protecting the biological and cultural resources on these open space lands. In addition to RMP directed management activities, other activities are also um, implemented by DPR staff to manage and maintain the open space lands and land stewardship and habitat management activities, which help protect both visitors and MSCB covered um, species and habitats include access control, DPR park ranger patrols. We also have the invasive non-native um, plant species treatment and removal. Public outreach is an incredibly powerful management tool that encourages visitors and residents to connect with open spaces and nature. Now, uh, annually, DPR's educational outreach efforts um, help thousands of San Diego visitors and residents connect with nature through an incredibly wide variety of programs. And together last year, these programs helped inform 17,000 youth at 28 parks, preserves, and campgrounds. It helped uh, 6,500 young hikers in the track trails program and over 3,400 visitors met our animal raptor ambassadors. Next slide, please. In addition to consistent ongoing ma maintenance and management, the county actively seeks grants to, to fund additional habitat restoration and enhancement projects. In 2019, work was done on six grant funded projects across six county preserves in the South County sub area work or plan area. The projects benefited MSCP covered species, including the coastal cactus wren, Belding's orange sorted whiptail, Northern Harrier, Lee Spells Vireo, and Cooper's Hawk. A couple of the grant funded projects that took place in 2019 were the implementation of a three year San Diego River Conservancy Prop 1 grant that will enhance 32 acres of riparian habitat along Sycamore Creek on Sycamore Canyon Preserve, Good and Ranch Preserve, as well as the continuation of a four year CNRA Prop 84 Rivers Parkway grant to restore and enhance Lee Spells Vireo riparian habitat at the Tijuana River Valley Regional Park. Monitoring is also a critical part of successfully managing open space. The monitoring data from inventory surveys as well as the county's targeted monitoring plan help inform us how well the MSCP preserve is functioning and how well we are meeting the MSCP conservation goals. Next slide, please. So I get to the fun part. 
Um, I'd like to take a few moments to talk about some of our success stories in the first 22 years of the MSCP. In the Tijuana River Valley, um, or TRV, or Tijuana River Valley Regional Park, or TRVRP as we call it, uh, DPR has restored or enhanced over 150 acres of riparian and upland habitat. The project areas are with, located within the blue boxes on the map. So during the completion of the TRVRP Trails EIR, approximately 70 acres of unauthorized trails were documented. And these rogue trails were formalized into 22 and a half acres, of, I'm sorry, 22 and a half miles of trails within our um, existing trail system. So habitat restoration of the closed unauthorized trails was um, commenced and successfully completed. And as you can see, there's one example on the photo from Monument Mesa. So the photo on the left is of an unauthorized trail before, um, before the restoration efforts happened. And then the photo on the right is after the successful restoration of the habitat. These restoration activities benefited many MSCP covered species, including the coastal California gnatcatcher and Lee Spells vireo. Next slide, please. So another success story that we have is our San Diego thorn mint population at Sycamore Canyon Good and Ranch Preserve. This species is uh, surveyed annually as part, of the, as part of the county's targeted monitoring plan, and the population can be found within the blue boxes on um, the map. Through dry years and wet years, we've been monitoring the population status and documenting any threats or stressors that can impact this population. The estimated population size has ranged from 5,000 individuals in one year to over 700,000 individuals in another year, just based on rainfall amounts during the winter and spring months. With a large population size and with the continued monitoring and management of stresses and thresser, uh, stress, threats and stressors, this population has been uh, successfully conserved. Next slide, please. So we are excited to work with all of our partners as we continue to acquire land and also to holistically assess the preserve in order to ensure that we are successfully meeting our goals and objectives of having a functioning, thriving South County sub-area plan preserve. The South County sub-area plan work is um, shifting focus now um, from acquisitions and preserve assemblage. And while that is still occurring, we're now shifting focus to really looking <clears throat> and ensuring that the preserve is functioning successfully and that our conservation goals are being met. We are also very excited that the County Board of Supervisors directed us last week to finalize the draft North County MSCB plan as part of our commitment to conservation. All of our partners and stakeholders engagement is absolutely critical to the North County plan. And we are looking forward to the next steps of the MSCP in our county. Next slide, please. So I just want to thank you for your time. And now I will turn the presentation over to Mark and Sarah at the City of San Diego. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Allen, and I am the MSCP biologist for the Parks and Recreation Department's Open Space Division at the City of San Diego. Uh, today I'm going to present an overview of our monitoring and management highlights from 2019. Uh, next slide. Uh, so just to go over for those that are not familiar, um, San, San Diego is, the city of San Diego is located in the southwest corner of our county. Actually, next slide. There it is in gray. And next slide. And here you can see our preserve system of mostly interconnected preserves and corridors in black within our city boundaries. Next slide. So the city adopted a multiple species conservation program in 1997. Uh, it's an adopted federal habitat conservation plan under the Endangered Species Act and an adopted natu natural communities conservation plan under the state of California's Natural Communities Conservation Planning Act. Uh, the city also adopted the Vernal Pool Habitat Conservation Plan in 2018, which expands upon the MSCP by conserving highly sensitive vernal pool species. 
Next slide. Currently, our preserve system includes almost 51,000 acres, of which 27,000 acres are open to, um, sorry about that, <laughs> are open to the public, and much of that is managed by the Parks and Recreation Department. As you can see here, this preserve system is actually similar in size to some of your favorite national parks. Next slide. However, unlike most national parks, uh, next slide. <laughs> this preserve system is surrounded by development. Next slide. The city of San Diego has open space canyons and urban preserves in nearly all neighborhoods in San Diego. And as you can imagine, this can lead to a lot of people venturing into these areas. Next slide. Based on a park use study that was conducted in 2016 in partnership with San Diego State University and CBI, uh, we came up with a rough estimate of about 6.8 to 8.4 million annual visits to our open space parks. Uh, believe it or not, these numbers are actually greater than Grand Canyon, Yosemite, and Yellowstone. Next slide. So as you can expect, managing uh, such a large urban preserve with high usage does have its challenges. Some of these challenges are constant, while others vary from year to year. Uh, in 2019, some of our biggest management challenges that we faced included human-caused fires. Next. Uh, so, so we had one in Otay Mesa, which was the previous photo. Uh, here's a news article. Um, we had somebody set 10 fires in one weekend in Otay Valley Regional Park. Uh, next. We also have issues with illegal lodging, um, next, uh, which contributes to a lot of trash in our open space areas, next. Uh, 2019 was a particularly wet year, so we had flooding to deal with, next. And with all that rain, uh, we also had a lot of invasive species, next including a new invasive species that we found in one of our vernal pool preserves. Uh, this is Ward's weed, um, which is a very aggressive invasive that we are dealing with. Uh, next slide. So to deal with all of these challenges, the city staffs an interdisciplinary team of 38 people who working alone or in concert have the expertise to solve just about any of these problems that get thrown our way. Uh, biologists like me focus on rare species sites and monitor um, those sites, work on natural, natural resource management plans, and update park rangers and staff on annual changes. We have pesticide applicators that work to treat invasive species issues. District managers supervises almost everyone and takes care of personnel issues. Um, grounds maintenance workers help our rangers with day-to-day -day maintenance tasks. Uh, our interns get thrown into the fray on their first day and work right alongside long-term staff as partners. Uh, our senior planners work on major natural resource issues, influence policy, and are the key liaisons to outside departments and agencies. And then we have our ranger staff, which are really jacks of all trades. They are constantly patrolling preserve areas, looking out for issues and fixing problems as they see them. They provide educational opportunities, work with volunteers, restore habitat, deal with invasive weed species themselves. They're repairing fences, maintaining trails. Uh, you name it, they're doing it. <laughs> so suffice to say, our team is very busy. Uh, next slide. So here I'm going to briefly highlight some of our management accomplishments from 2019. Uh, 2019 was a great year for, for public engagement, education, and volunteers. At Mission Trails alone, we had over 3,000 adults and over 2,000 children participate in ranger-led walks and hikes. Over 6,000 students participated in curriculum-based school programs. An estimated 110,000 people visited the Mission Trails Visitor Center and Tuckalodi Nature Center. And we had a total of 
4,822 volunteers dedicate over 27,000 hours of time to interpretive cleanup, restoration, and park beautification activities. Next slide. Our park rangers uh, also worked with City of San Diego Police Department, Environmental Services Department, and Quality of Life teams to evict unsheltered individuals illegally camping in preserved areas and unoccupied in, and to clean up the unoccupied encampments. Um, a total of 714 tons of trash and debris were removed from city open space areas in 2019. Next slide. This was also a big year for weeds and invasive plant management. A total of 142 invasive plant, tons of invasive plant material were removed from open space preserve areas. Uh, a minimum of three weed maintenance visits were performed at each of the 23 vernal pool complexes that are managed by the Parks and Recreation Department. And we applied for and were awarded a WCB grant to fund eradication of invasive wardsweed and restore impacted vernal pools at Robin Hood Ridge Vernal Pool site. Next slide. All right, so yeah, it was also a big year for habitat restoration. Um, obviously, when we get a lot of rain, um, the invasive plants do well, but also our native plants do well. Uh, we planted a total of 4,090 native container plants uh, to protect and restore habitat adjacent to trails. Uh, we continued work on a habitat restoration uh, project for San Diego Thornment in partnership with the Mission Trails Foundation and Recon Environmental and put added approximately 36,000 San Diego Thornment seeds that were bulked by the San Diego Zoo Center for Plant Conservation to the site in October 2019. And over 3,000 cactus cuttings were planted at the Navajo Canyon and Choyas Radio Canyon areas in December as part of a Sandag grant funded cactus wren habitat restoration project. Next slide. We also had a burrowing owl surprise. In the winter of 2018 2019, uh, Ranger Mika Shimada and some of our pesticide applicator staff began mowing and treating weeds in a 20 acre site in Western Otai Valley Regional Park. Uh, this area was densely invaded with crown daisy and their goal was to prevent the spread of crown daisy into more intact adjacent habitat. Uh, to everyone's surprise, uh, two burrowing owl pairs moved into the site um, in fall of 2019. And we kept an eye on these guys. And with some assistance from the zoo's burrowing owl team, we were able to confirm that both pairs uh, successfully bred at the site and produced an estimated nine fledglings this spring, this past spring. The zoo also confirmed that one of the owls that was a banded owl that came from their Lone Star site that they've been monitoring. Uh, next slide. So with all the rain we had, 2019 was also a really busy year for monitoring rare plant species. Uh, this is a list of all the species that we monitored that year. Uh, next slide. We monitored a total of 69 IMG sampling points for a total of 51 occurrences citywide. Next slide. And these are just some nice photos of a few of the species that we monitored. There's variegated Dudleya, San Diego Thornmint, Otai Tar Plant, Shortleaf Dudleya, Coast Wallflower, and Orchids Brodea. Next slide. And for time's sake, I'm not going to go into detail on all of our monitoring results, um, but I just wanna show you a few photos that demonstrate the contrast between a dry year, 2018, and a wet year, 2019. Uh, this was one of our Otai tar plant populations uh, in, located in Denary Canyon. In 2018, it was pretty difficult to find plants at this site, and we only counted 388 total plants in a one acre area. In 2019, the site was literally covered in tar plant, and we mapped over 14 acres and estimated roughly 4 million plants at the site. So that just shows what a difference a year can make um, from 
you know, low rainfall to high rainfall. Next slide. Uh, story is similar for vernal pools. Uh, in 2018, we had very few pools that held water for a significant amount of time. Whereas in 2019, nearly every pool was filled and held water for quite a while. Um, and the difference is striking. The top photos here show the pools in 20, spring of 2018. And then the bottom photos show the same pools in spring of 2019. Uh, and you can see it's quite different. Um, next slide. Uh, this was also a great year for monitoring vernal pool wildlife. Uh, you can see here there's some San Diego fairy shrimp, Riverside fairy shrimp, and a young spadefoot toad hanging out in one of the soil cracks in the vernal pools. Next slide. This was also a year that we started rolling out some new technological advances. Uh, we rolled out an integrated ArcGIS mobile software apps for all of our ranger staff. Uh, we created a survey one, two, three form that allows the ranger staff to quickly and easily log their management actions and any issues that they noted while in the field. The survey one, two, three data is then linked to a collector map that the rangers can use in the field to view and update information that they've logged. The collector app also includes useful reference layers um, that they can pull up at any point, such as parcel info, the MHPA boundary, locations of sensitive species, um, et cetera. The rangers can pull up and reference these pretty much instantly, as opposed to having to go back to the office and log onto a computer or pull out paper maps to find this information. Next slide. Uh, and this is just showing um, the information. If you tap on one of these uh, points on the ranger collector map, it shows the detailed information of what was collected. They can also take photos and attach photos to each of these points as well. Next slide. Uh, this new technology literally puts these resources at our ranger's fingertips, and we're hoping that this makes their jobs a little bit easier while also improving the data quality and management of our natural areas. Throughout 2020, we've been gathering feedback from our rangers and making improvements to these tools um, continuously, uh, but we're already getting some really great feedback and from the rangers and we're seeing a lot of data get recorded that in the past might have just kind of gotten lost in the fray because um, everybody's so busy it's hard to make the time to record this information, but if you have just, you know, got the app right there at your fingertips it's really easy to input the information in a few seconds on your phone. Alright, next slide. All right, and that's all I have. Um, with that, I will con conclude my talk. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. Um, up next, I'd like to introduce Dai Huang from the City of Chula Vista's Department of Development Services and Anna Levitt, Levitt from Recon Environmental. Um, thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Dai Huang, and I am with the City of Chula Vista. Next slide, please. Today, I am going to talk about an overview and generating report status of the Chula Vista MSCP sub area plan and an update on the management and monitoring of the Otay Ranch Preserve and Roan Hill Ranch. Next slide, please. The Chula Vista MSCP sub area plan goal are to conserve cover species and their habitat such as Kino Checker Spot Butterfly, Coastal Cactus Grant, and to secure intercollected significant habitat core and linkage, such as the Otaran area, and to provide long term management and monitoring. Next slide, please. Julia Vista um, MSCP sub air plan was approved uh, in February 2003. January 2005, the Wildlife Agency issued city take permit and site implementation agreement. The sub area plan provides conservation for 86 covered species. 
99% hot light preserve, conserve estimate total of 9200 acres, Chula MSCP area, approximately 5000 acres within Chula Vista and additional 4200 acres in the county. The sub area plan also identified development standard, mitigation, a framework for management and monitoring, and long term ma preserve management funding, such as the community facility ditches for management and monitoring. Next slide, please. The sub area plan boundary is generally bound by the national city to the north, Otay Lake to the east. Otay River Valley to the south, and San Diego Bay to the west. A key component to our local and regional conservation contribution is the assembly and management of the Otayland Preserve, the majority of which is located in the unincorporated area of the county. Next slide, please. 2019 conservation started. Uh, approximately 66% completed within Chula Vista sub area plan, 85% gain outside the city. Overall contribution is approximately 75%. Next slide, please. This exhibit shows the current preserve status within the city. Next slide, please. This exhibit shows the uh, Otayland Preserve, the majority of the conservation uh, located uh, outside the city within the uh, unincorporated area of the county. Next slide, please. The Otayland Preserve include approximately 11 plus thousand acres and will be assembled and managed by the uh, city of Chula Vista and the county, also known as Palm. Funding to the establishment of the committee for uh, facility ditches. As of today, uh, a plum is four plus thousand acres under palm management. Next slide, please. 2019 monitoring and management activity. Monitoring include baseline survey, coastal cactus grant, list belvero and yellow bill cuckoo survey, rare plant survey. Fair swim survey, volar pool plan survey, database contribution. Management include routine site visit, needle removal, access control, fence, gate, site repair, invasive species treatment. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Lone Hill Land Preserve, total 214 acres acquired in 2013, funding to the community facility ditches. The implementation of the Roan Hill Ranch ASMD is currently underway. In 2019, the activity include Kino Checker Spot Butterfly Survey. The survey focused on the high quality Kino habitat and generally suitable for Kino with the abundant host plant and nectar species present. Access control include new sinus, fence repair, and invasive weed control. Next slide, please. These are the photo of the Kino host plant within the uh, survey area. Next slide, please. And with that, I would like to introduce Anna Levitt, old Tyrant store biologist, and she will talk more about the uh, annual report. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Di. So my name is um, Anna Levitt. I work for Recon Environmental, and I've been the preserve steward biologist for Otay Ranch Preserve for the last 11 years. And I'm going to be focusing in on Otay Ranch Preserve today. Next slide. So just to give you an overview, Otay Ranch Preserve is located in southwestern San Diego County near the US-Mexico border. In the middle of the map there, you can see Lower Otay Reservoir. The preserve is managed jo jointly by the city of Chula Vista and the county of San Diego. And in 2019, 
there were just under 4,000 acres that have been conveyed into the preserve. And ultimately at build out, there'll be just over 11,000 acres. Our management and monitoring tasks are guided by um, the resource management plan phase one and phase two, which was updated in 2018. And just to give you um, a little overview of what I'm gonna talk about today. So I'll discuss um, highlights from our 2019 monitoring actions. And as part of our 2019 tasks, we prepared a 10 year summary report that covered from 2009 through 2019. And so I'll also um, be sprinkling in some highlights from those monitoring and management tasks as well. Next slide. So really the starting point on the preserve when lands are conveyed is um, baseline surveys. So in 2019, we surveyed 181 acres of newly conveyed land within the ridge parcels, which are located in the Humboldt Mountains, as well as the Wolf, Western Wolf Canyon parcels, which are shown in the map here. And that's located in the city of Chula Vista at the south end of La Media Road. And over the last 10 years, from 2009 to 2019, um, just over 2,500 2, acres have been conveyed into the preserve where we've conducted baseline surveys. So for baseline surveys, we start with vegetation mapping. We also um, provide a list of plants and wildlife that we observe within the newly conveyed lands. We establish long-term photo monitoring locations to help with, with our management in the future. And we also document any access issues that are observed that we need to deal with in the future, as well as recommendations that we might have for habitat restoration. And we provide a list of um, sensitive species that have potential to occur within the parcel set that we will recommend focus surveys for in the future. Next slide. So now for vernal pools in our Salt Creek parcels, which are located just south of Lower Otai Reservoir, there's a mesa top there that shows Mima Mound topography, but it no longer has functional hydrology to form vernal pools. So in 2015, as part of the City of Chula Vista Kino Checker Spot Butterfly Recovery Program, we established 30 pools in that area. And 2019 was our first opportunity to conduct focus surveys for both um, sensitive wildlife and vernal pool plants within that area. And 2019 was um, a normal rain year based on rainfall data from Brownfield. And so we we're excited to be able to survey during that year because it meant that all 30 of those pools ponded and we were able to survey all of them. So our survey data showed that eight of the vernal pools had San Diego fairy shrimp within them. And we were excited to see that we didn't have any versatile fairy shrimp within them. And so why we we're excited about that is that in the future, we're potentially going to propose um, translocating the San Diego fairy shrimp into the pools that we found that are unoccupied with, with shrimp. We also took a look at and documented pools that had um, spadefoot toad within them. And there were six of those pools that had spadefoot toad, either egg masses or tadpoles within them. And then when we looked at vernal pool plant indicator species, we had all of the pools except for one that had those indicator species. And so this was really exciting to see because this area no longer functioned with vernal pools until we came in and established those 30 pools. And so what it shows is that there was a, a, a an historic seed bank on that mesa that was basically just waiting for ponding to occur to express itself. So not just with plants, but fairy shrimp eggs were also in the soil seed, seed bank. And um, our data is gonna help guide future habitat restoration in this area, which I'll show on, on the next slide. So next slide, please. So this is just an example on the top two photos that shows these uh, sampling of the um, pools that were established at Salt Creek and the vernal pool plants that um, expressed themselves after the rainfall event in 2019. In the middle, there's spadefoot toad tadpoles that were observed. 
And then in the bottom left hand corner, that is Otay Otay cement that occurs within the city of San Diego Cal Terrace's property. And so for, for part of our restoration effort within Otay Ranch Preserve, we don't want to just create um, vernal pools that only hold water. We really want to make high quality vernal pool habitat. And so part of that effort is we have a right of entry permit through the city of San Diego to collect uh, vernal pool plant seed from the Cal Terrace property. And we are dispersing that within the Salt Creek vernal pools that have been established. And then on the right hand side on the bottom, this is just um, an example of our crew working hard to hand weed the non-native species within one of the vernal pools that, that occurs on Otay Mesa within the preserve. Next slide. So for Kino Checker Spot, um, in 2019, we surveyed one parcel set, the Proctor Valley parcels. This is in the Hamul Mountains, just east of Proctor Valley Road. This was our first um, round of focus surveys. These parcels have been conveyed in 2017. And uh, we, we detected one adult Kino that year. During the surveys, we found that this parcel set had really abundant nectar plants, but host plants are not abundant with this, within this area. But just off site is CDFW property and all along the ridge line there, that's really high quality occupied habitat. So it'll be interesting to see in the coming years as we continue our ongoing monitoring if our population is actually larger within our Proctor Valley parcels than what was detected in 2019. So in addition to focus surveys, we also completed a year and a half long project that was funded through a CDFW local assistance grant. And that was a six acre project and I'll show that on the next slide. But what I wanted to show, okay, that's fine. Um, so here's an example of how our Kino data guides our habitat restoration. If you look, so both of these figures are located within the San Ysidro Mountains, which is southeast of Lower Otay Reservoir. The upper figure shows Kino data that has been documented in that area. And then the bottom figure shows how that data guided where we pr proposed the six acre uh, habitat restoration. And then just as a side note, off to the left on the bottom, that's our crew. They're temporarily placing tarps over uh, Kino Checker Spot Butterfly host plant to make sure that it's protected when they spray herbicide outside of that area where there's no host plant located. Next slide. And then for coastal cactus wren, in 2019, we didn't have any focused surveys, but we did record, in, record incidental observations. So the Western Wolf Canyon parcels, if you recall, those were conveyed in 2019, and that's when we conducted baseline surveys. So during those surveys, we recorded our incidental observations, and in the future, we'll be doing focused surveys. We also um, conducted incidental observations at the Salt Creek parcels near Lower Otay Reservoir. But our main focus in 2019 was on habitat restoration um, where we treated weeds primarily in areas that were previously funded by SANDAG Transnet grants. And as of um, the last 10 years, we've successfully restored 56 acres primarily within the Salt Creek parcels and then also within our millennia parcels on Otay Mesa. And so this, the, the data that we collect from our focus surveys is helping guide us with future cactus wren habitat restoration. It's also providing information to help guide us where there's shrub thinning that needs to occur where it's overtopping nesting size choya. Next slide. So this is an example of how our cactus wren data guides habitat restoration on, on the left hand side. This is the image of is of our salt creek parcels near lower Otay Reservoir. This is all of our cactus wren data that we've collected over the years. And you can see on the right hand side, these polygons are areas where we're, we're conducting habitat restoration. So really the data is driving where we conduct this restoration effort. Next slide. 
And as I mentioned, for baseline surveys, we establish repeat photo monitoring locations. And so this is an example of how valuable those photos can be. The, the photo on the left is from 2009, prior to any weed treatment within this cactus wren habitat. And then on the right is a more current photo, and you can see how much that, that weed treatment and habitat restoration has um, increased the quality of the habitat. The ground is now open for cactus wren foraging, and you can see how much the cholla has grown with removing competition from weeds. Next slide. So access issues are high priority within the preserve. In 2019, we conducted a sign inventory at our millennia parcels, which are shown in that bottom figure on Otay Mesa near Johnson Canyon East, and then also at the Salt Creek parcels. And so the importance of us knowing you know, what signs need to be repaired or are missing is that we need to make sure that we're in compliance with, um, with being able to enforce uh, trespassing. And so over the last 10 years, we've had great success with installing fence, signs, gates, and natural barriers within the preserve to block unauthorized access. We've had especially great success with installing cholla to, to block trails that have formed. And then that has the benefit too that we're getting an increase in cactus wren habitat when we plant that. And then a big success was the Minnewawa truck trail barrier that was installed in 2016. So that barrier is similar to what was installed on Proctor Valley Road. Um, we monitor that, that barrier every year since 2016 to see if anybody has you know, attempted to tear it out or damage it in any way, and it's, it's pretty beefy. And so to date, we haven't seen any damage to that barrier other than small amounts of graffiti. And then currently and into the future, we're working to close down an unauthorized trail that's unofficially called the Horseshoe Peak Trail that um, runs along Horse or along Hamul Mountains. And so we're working with the city of San Diego to close that down because uh, that, that illegal trail crosses through their property as well as our property. Next slide. And then finally, in 2019, we prepared three informational videos. And if you're interested in watching those, they're um, linked on the City of Chula Vista website. And that's all I have for today. Thank you. And Dave Mayer with CDFW is going to be presenting next. Thank you, Anna. Uh, can you hear me? Somebody nod or close? Yes. Excellent. Okay, thank you. And so I'm David Mayer with California Department of Fish and Wildlife. It is a pleasure to be here and it is a great pleasure to listen to the stories of, from the permittees because on a day-by-day -day basis when we're working on projects, we just don't have time or we maybe we just aren't listening to hear this stuff and this is the good news. So um, bring it on. It's too bad it's only once a year. Next slide, please. So unfortunately, we don't have some of the things that I should be talking about for 2019. We don't have any acquisitions for 2019. So I'll, I'll touch on a couple for 2020 um, and introduce a project out at Rancho Homo we started on some exotics removal and give you a burrowing owl update. Next slide, please. So within the MSCP, we currently have Owen and managed 28,822 acres. We had two acquisitions in 2020 earlier this year. Some of them were right at the very beginning of the year at the end of 2019, but escrow didn't close. Uh, next slide. Uh, so looking over on the east side, kind of middle, you see a couple of red dots. Those were our acquisitions most recently. Next slide. Uh, this is the Sloan Canyon or Orem property. It's some relatively steep slopes right above Slope Canyon, but it adds in nicely with our reserve, uh, not high management required, and it adds for more protection. And then the Benneke property, 86 acres, which will go into our McGinty Mountain, uh, ecolog and, yeah, McGinty Mountain Ecological Reserve. Next slide, please. So one thing I did want to take a second, I know technically this is not within the MSCP, 
but it's a really contributing part to the MSCP. And that was the acquisition of Montecito Ranch. Next slide, please. Uh, so this has been, uh, gosh, in my 20 years, it's been pretty much on the burner the whole time as a proposed project, some, oh gosh, uh, potential legal actions on illegal disking and such along the way, but ultimately it got acquired through a combination of REPI grants, Section 6 money, and Wildlife Conservation Board, and it is now owned by the Endangered Habitats Conservancy. And you'll see why it's significant, although outside of the MSCP boundary, it is very much a part of the Ramona grasslands on the eastern side and has some resources you don't get everywhere else. So next slide, please. So about 955 acres. Well, I should have mentioned um, there is a possibility this will at some point be transferred from Endangered Habitats Conservancy to the department. Um, that could be five years out, maybe never, maybe sooner, but um, at this point in time, it's in great hands. So of those 955 acres, there's a lot of grasslands, as I said, it's contiguous with Ramona grasslands. There's also sage scrub, chaparral, eucalyptus in patches, and some oaks. There are vernal pools and great potential to restore vernal pools. Gnat catchers are documented, and it had at one point Stephen's kangaroo rat, uh, and then it suddenly, one of those air quotes, mysteriously disappeared. And again, with the preppy money, the management is intending to manage the property for Stephen's kangaroo rat and other species. It also has southern tar plant. Next slide, please. Just a couple of shots of the property. Next slide. Southern tar plant. Next slide. Kind of a cattle area, but it just shows the potential for vernal pool resources with um, enhancement. Next slide. So at Rancho Humboldt, and kind of in the central-ish northeast portion of that picture on the left, that's the Rancho Humboldt uh, facilities of Ranch House that most of you are aware of, and that's Humboldt Creek. And we have locations where we've been doing trapping. So on the right, we've got a couple of photos of Humboldt Creek. The issue in here, well, next slide. So why do we want to remove exotics? Okay, common sense maybe just tells us we're managing the property, we should be doing better with that. But um, of significance is that it's always had a lot of bullfrogs, especially as you go downstream to the big pond kind of near the kiln. The crayfish are abundant in the creeks. We have African clawed frogs as well. They're more so in the pond, but they also get out into the creeks. So back in 2014, for those remembering at home, we had pond turtles translocated by USGS out to the pond. We still have not had any juveniles recruit. That's very disappointing. We also have native invertebrates in very low numbers or absent. And again, those remembering from past presentations, Robert Fisher pointed out where you have dragonflies and you don't have crayfish, you generally don't have mosquitoes. Where you have a lot of crayfish and no dragonflies, you have a lot of mosquitoes. And in between, you know, some balance between the two. So there's a good reason, <laughs> selfishly, I, mosquitoes love me, so I, I'd be happy if they're, the mosquitoes are gone. And also looking out two, three years potentially, we could look that this is a relocation site for red-legged frog. Next slide, please. So this is predominantly be, being done by traps, as well as with hand nets, dip nets. Next slide. With respect to the bullfrogs, um, again, this is a point I need to give a shout out for USGS. They do fantastic work regardless of whose property it is, and they do absolutely amazing work for us on our property. So you've got Carlton on the left, um, and you know Chris Brown, and Robert Fisher, and more people there than I can remember to name, but they do fantastic things, not the least of which is get rid of some of the biggest bullfrogs I've ever seen, for sure. Next slide, please. And then with respect to the crayfish, this is between June and October. This, isn't, this is like 
a, a couple days or a day or two of harvest. But between June and October, over 6,200 adults, almost 5,000 juveniles. And of course, at the bottom left, you see sometimes bullfrogs get into the nets as well. Next slide. I don't know if this is going to play. I just put it in as a quick joke um, for CDFW's version of Deadliest Catch. These things move quickly and we're using tongs. So we're not as brave as those people on Deadliest Catch who grab those seven pound Alaskan king crabs, but nonetheless, it's effective in getting them out of the way. And then they're, at this point, they've been feeding a very happy platypus, I believe, at the San Diego Wild Animal Park. Next slide. Switching now just to give a quick update on the burrowing owl translocation program at Rancho Humboldt. I'm not gonna go through the history and tell you everything we did. I did that last year, but so the significant dates here are in 2014, we started a grazing program um, cattle grazing specifically. And then in 2018, uh, next slide please, establish a partnership with the Institute of Conservation Research at the San Diego Zoo. This is my second shout out. Um, they are just absolutely fantastic. Colleen, Suzanne, Lisa, Ron, and again, a lot of folks whose names I unfortunately forget. They do amazing science, like real science, in terms of the translocation, supplementary feeding, all the nest monitoring and banding. And if there's a problem, they respond like you would want any, you know, police to respond. They are amazing. Um, our staff has been doing vegetation management as needed. If the cows aren't taking care of it, we do some select mowing, mowing or weed whacking. Um, Burrow maintenance for the artificial burrows, do what we can to get the squirrels to expand. Uh, next slide, please. So twice a year, again, this is in the fall, so we can pick up any dispersing, dispersing individuals and have a suitable artificial burrow if they want it. And then just before the breeding season, we do it again. Next slide, please. So here's the results that I wanna highlight. 2018, there were five pairs translocated Four of the five pairs attempted nesting. We got 17 fledges out of that. But unfortunately, post-fledging, as we went into that late fall and the peregrine falcons and other species kind of showed up or whatever was getting them, a lot of those juveniles were getting picked off. And we knew that basically from the piles of uh, owl feathers we were finding. But it's a good start. And this is something that had not happened despite all of our best intentions and efforts prior to ICR being involved. Next slide, please. In 2019, we expanded all of it. So some really good news at the start of 2019 was that we had um, adults uh, that had been translocated the previous year had returned and we had juveniles return. Um, we had additional translocation birds from the border area. There was a repair going on, so they needed to get out of harm's way. We had a place to put them. There were some other owls coming from the safari park, and we actually had two wild owls settle on the property. And I'm just checking something because my screen's cut off a little bit. I wanna make sure I'm not missing anything. Next slide, please. So at the end of 2019, we had 10 pairs on site. We had 11 nesting temps, four of which were successful, producing 18 owl fledges. So, you know, again, four successful nests each year, getting a little bit better, I suppose, but basically somewhere in that 18 pair of fledges, 18 fledges at the end of 2019 season, we had 30 burrowing owls. Next slide, please. Okay, so here we go with a, we added a second area for artificial burrows, that's field seven up on the right-hand side near the top, compared to the burrowing owl habitat management area, or BOMA, in the southeast portion of the slide. And here are some great results, encouraging. Next slide, please. So starting off 2020, we had seven owls that stayed and we had eight juveniles return. 
There were 18 additional translocated birds from various sources with the San Diego Zoo's efforts. Three new wild owls showed up. In summary, we had 14 breeding pairs this time, 15 nesting attempts, nine successful nests, 46 owl fledges. And last August, end of August, beginning of September, there were 85 owls on the property. That is pretty darn good in my mind after three years of effort. Next slide, please. So just looking forward, I, this is a slide I had last year, kind of what I call our soft goals, meaning you know, this is what we're trying to get going out here. So at some point, and I don't know if 2020 will be this, the year, but we'll be talking with ICR and see if we want to do any hacking or not in 2020, or let all those birds that have been finding the place come back and use artificial burrows. Maybe they'll use a natural burrow. Uh, we did get a little bit better juvenile survival. I think we're averaging you know, a little bit over five uh, fledges per successful nest. So it's you know not huge going from four to five, but it's an improvement. We are seeing more of them using actual squirrel burrows. I don't know that we had any breeding in it yet. We're doing our best to keep expanding the squirrel colonies, keeping a consistent grazing regime out there for um, improvement, I guess. The idea being over time, we want it to become more natural and less having to be managed on those artificial burrows. And then prey base improvement uh, for whatever reason, um, and you can easily speculate, but we this was the year of the grasshopper out there and there was a lot of food available that probably helped. But um, I think also just the basic grass being under control is a big factor. And that is my last slide. So I will turn it over to Kim Smith of the San Diego Association of Governments. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Can you guys hear me? Okay. A nod. Oh. Okay, if you can. So um, good morning and thank you all for being here. Um, and I just wanna say thank you, a quick thank you to the city for hosting this virtual meeting this year. And it's really great to see all the work that's been done um, throughout the county. So for those of you that don't know me, my name is Kim Smith, and I'm the program manager for the Environmental Mitigation Program at SANDAG. And giving this presentation with me is Dr. Chris Preston. She's an ecologist for the San Diego Management and Monitoring Program through USGS. So both Chris and I are here to present on SANDAG and SDMMP's efforts on developing metrics to measure the overall health of our preserve system. And so I'm gonna start off the presentation by giving some background on why we're leading this effort and our progress to date. And then I'm gonna hand it back to Chris to get down into the details of the framework of the metrics. And she's also gonna show some examples. So next slide, please. So why is SANDAG um, and SDMMP involved in developing these metrics? Um, so first, as a requirement under the TransNet program, a recommendation from our independent taxpayer oversight committee, their triennial performance audit. Um, I'm not gonna read the text above, but really what that performance audit, um, what came out of that, the recommendation boiled down to is for us to develop metrics um, to measure the overall success of our preserve um, using all the data that we've been collecting over the past 10 plus years. And then um, to try and take that data and communicate those performance results, not only back to the auditors but and to our board, but to the, the public. And then secondly, to use those metrics to help promote our regional, our regional habitat conservation vision. So SANDAG has been, um, working with the EMP working group members to develop this vision in light of the development of our regional plan and the five big moves. And the metrics, um, those metrics can be used to further support or promote this regional habitat conservation vision, which can help direct policy and decision-making guide management and increase the funding efficiency at a larger scale. Next slide, please. So where have we been and what have we done? Um, just a year ago, which seems so long. Um, last November, we held a preserve metrics workshop to gather in, input from on what type of metrics participants would want to see measured to better understand the health of our preserve. We had over 65 attendees, including working group members, resource agencies, land managers, and members of our jurisdiction. And then in March of last year, we took all the input and data that we had been collect that had been collected 
And then we worked to really um, further define um, a framework for our metrics. Um, so next slide, please. So the framework, the framework shown on the slide above shows the overall categories on how we would want to measure our preserve system based on the input we received and also the goals and objectives that we measure in our management strategic plan. So quickly, we um, develop three categories, species, habitats, and threats. And under species, there are three subcategories landscape species, and those are really what we're thinking of as our wide roaming species, like the mountain lion or the golden eagle. And then we have rare and specialist species. Examples of those are would be the Hermes copper butterfly or um, the pond turtle. And then habitat community species. Those would be species that are associated with one particular type of habitat, like uh, gnat, catch gnat catcher and maybe cactus wren with coastal sage scrub. And then we have a category on habitats and we broke those up as CSS chaparral and grassland, riparian oak woodlands, and then this other category sensitive habitats, which include, you know, vernal pools, coastal salt marsh, coastal dunes, torrey pines, and Takati cypress. And then finally, our last category is threats. We've got seven threats um, that we're going to be looking at. So next slide, please. And this kind of just illustrates how we see this all tying in. Um, you know, we've got our management strategic plan, which is updated every five years. Um, we have EMP funding that is really guided by our two-year work plan. And then we're hoping that our metrics, or we're planning on our metrics to be updated annually. So these metrics that we develop have to be very easy, easily replicable. Next slide, please. So where, where are we headed? Um, pretty much from now until March, we're gonna be you know, taking all the data that we have, preparing metrics, preparing our report, and looking at uh, putting all these results up on a web portal that would be easy for folks to access and understand. In December or January, we're going to be giving another progress report to the working group. In March of 2021, we need to have our, we need to give a, the draft state of the preserve report um, a presentation to our working group with the final um, report going to the working group in June. And then that final report would get um, forwarded over to our auditors in July of 2021. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Chris to talk about um, more of the specific metrics we are developing. Chris. Thank you, Kim. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. I'm so uh, excited about all the um, wonderful work that our partners are doing, all the um, jurisdictions and the wildlife agencies to make uh, this San Diego County Preserve System um, function so well. It's just really inspiring to see all of the management that's going on. The um, San Diego Management and Monitoring Program and SANDAG, what we do is we try to support the land owners and managers and provide extra benefits such as monitoring at a regional scale across the preserve system, providing uh, competitive grants for, um, for activities of management, as well as actually um, conducting some management such as invasive species control across the preserve system. So we're sort of here to add to what the all of our partners are doing, which is quite a bit. And it's nice to see as these workshops go on each year, there's so much more being done. And, and that's a good thing because we have so many more threats <laughs> since the uh, MSCP started. We have a lot of threats in, involving fire and um, changing climate in terms of more drought and things like that. But um, by doing this management and monitoring, we are really able to try to keep the, the preserve system functioning at a high um, high level. And so um, next please. Thank you. So as Kim mentioned, we have uh, these, we have the, both the species, the habitat or vegetation categories and threats. I'm going to focus in on the species, an example from that, and the vegetation. Next. And so as Kim mentioned, we have landscape species that move around the landscape a lot. They tend to use a variety of habitats and they are really important indicators of how well our preserve system is connected. And so we will have metrics looking at how those species are doing. And those are species where there's um, a fair amount of monitoring data. Next. And then there's rare and specialist species that have very uh, specialized habitat requirements 
or very restricted distributions where they may be found only in San Diego County, or maybe they extend a little bit into Riverside and Orange and south into Baja, but they're, they're species that are, do not have a, a wide distribution and um, they have specialized habitat requirements. Next. And then we have species that are indicative of our major habitat or vegetation communities. So coastal sage grub, the, you know, the, the classic examples are the California gnat catcher and the coastal cactus wren and so on. And um, so those are ones that give us an idea of how those um, species are functioning in those vegetation communities. Next. I'm gonna to start today with San Diego thorn mint, which you've already been shown some examples of this today. And this is a species that's endemic um, to San Diego County and uh, a little bit beyond the borders, but it's a very uh, uh, restricted distribution and it's not doing all that well. Um, next. So I'll first focus on talking about occurrences and the percent of occurrences that are now on conserved land. So we can go back to when the MSCP started and we can show how uh, many of these occurrences have been conserved. Next. And right now about 70%, not quite, of known occurrences are on conserved lands. And that's really good. And some of these other occurrences may no longer be extant on private lands. So we've done a good job of capturing the majority of populations. And, um, and so we, uh, we're, that's, that's a really good thing. Next. Um, so we also um, have a region-wide monitoring program for rare plants that's built on efforts um, of our land managers. So we, as a region, we've adopted a protocol that the land managers use, and then Sandeg provides some gap funding or some funding for those occurrences that land managers, for some one reason or another, are un unable to manage. And so across the region, we're all monitoring these species in the same way. So we have a huge data set. And it really helps us to understand what's going on with these species, uh, with the species across the range. Um, so for instance, we, we collect information on population um, uh, status in terms of the number of plants, how it's mapped on the landscape, um, the extent of the population, on habitat characteristics and on threats. Next. So this is an example from our regional data set from between 2014 and 2019, just looking at how average population size has fluctuated in relation to rainfall patterns. And as you can see, 2017 was a great year for San Diego thorn mint, but there was a lot of variability on how populations responded. The other thing to show is that this, the populations tend to be small overall, and, and that's not um, unusual for this species because it's restricted to clay lands that are small in nature, but we have also seen declines in this population and that's why uh, this species, that's why we're monitoring it so carefully. Next. And I'm going to focus now in on an individual preserve. So when we do our metrics, we might, uh, we're going to have this, I forgot to mention this, we're going to have a, a, a dashboard where you can go and you can zoom in and hover over the preserve and you can click on a species or you can click on a vegetation community or you can click on a threat and then it will show some metrics for the entire preserve system and then you can focus in and dial down to a specific location and get more information. So for this I'm using an example of Mission Trails Regional Park, their San Diego thorn mint occurrence. Uh, the, the city has been monitoring this occurrence for since 2006 and they've done an amazing job as management, as you'll see. So we can focus in on this individual occurrence. Next. And you can see where it's been mapped over time since 2014. And actually there's mapping that goes back to 2006. I just showed you more recent years. And um, you'll notice that most of it is down at the bottom of a slope where most of those polygons are. And there's a little red polygon at the top and that'll be explained in a moment. But you can see that the population's pretty much consistently been in the same location. Next. And this shows what the population has done in terms of size over that period of time. And so if somebody wanted to say, what is the state of the preserve system? They could look how the populations are doing overall and then they can come down and look at each population on its own. And you can see this one has really fluctuated between over 700 plants down to um, less, way less than 100. 
And a lot of that appears to be due to precipitation, but there's other things going on there as well. Next. And part of that is threats. So here is a graph showing non-native grasses in dark orange, non-native forbs in light orange, uh, dumping in blue and trampling in yellow. And so every year when they go out to monitor, the city collects information on the threats to this population. And you can see that the invasive um, non-native grasses have really declined over time, independent of what's happening with the rainfall. And that's not an accident. Next. That's because there's been a lot of management of that population. And you could see this, the county was able to show you where they've done uh, control of uh, invasive plants. The city of Chula Vista showed that as well as uh, the city of San Diego. So our land managers are really working on these populations to try to get rid of these invasive plants that outcompete at times are these annual, um, I mean, these native plants, especially some of these annuals. Um, the city was an, awarded uh, a transnet grant to collect seed to increase the population. Next. Whoops. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I was supposed to go back to showing. Um, oh, I guess that, I guess it was, there it is. The little population up there is where they actually um, installed seed. And so now we're looking to see that it's uphill. We're hoping that that will expand down slope. So, you know, these are the kinds of actions that are really important out there. When you have a population is pretty small, you wanna expand it so that it's more resilient to all of these um, threats posed by um, climate change and invasive and plants and so on. Next. So I'm just gonna go quickly through a habitat example. Um, we have a lot of different metrics we can use for these different habitats that sort of indicate the state of the preserve. So we have coastal sage grub, chaparral and grassland, um, riparian and oak woodland, and then sensitive habitats. Today I'm going to focus on the coastal sage grub, chaparral and grassland primarily, but first we can just look uh, the number of acres by habitat in the county. We can look at how much has been conserved over time and develop graphs showing that. Next. So I'll just show you that real quickly, next. And this just shows you how much has been conserved of particular habitat types or vegetation communities. And um, you can, uh, and then we also have uh, the ability to do these metrics since the preserve system started in 1997, 98 to present, next. Um, we can look at how many acres have been enhanced and restored, next. So for example, just through uh, transnet funds, this doesn't include all of the efforts that the land managers are doing independently. We can see that there's been over um, 600 acres, um, 650 acres of habitat restoration and enhancement. And that's just uh, in, since the transnet program started um, in, and mainly from 2009 forward. Next. And we can also look at ecological integrity. So that's how well the system is able to recover from disturbance such as wildfire. And um, that's really a, one of the uh, main disturbances across our landscape is fire. And when you have too much fire happening in an area, it can cause what we call habitat conversion. So it can create a shrubland, um, a coastal sage scrubland can move over into um, a, just a non-native grassland over time. And so it's really important that we identify areas that are struggling to return after, recover after fire or other disturbances. Next. So we are working on a model of how to do this using a combination of um, imagery, satellite imagery and aerial um, photography, as well as LIDAR. And this is a very draft, this is an old presentation, we've updated this, but depending on how you ent define an integrity of the coastal sage grub, um, which is based on the amount of shrub cover versus non-native invasive cover. Um, you can see that right now, most of our lands fall in the medium integrity category. And then there's some in the high and there's a lesser amount in the low. Next. And we can map this out of the, across the landscape. So this is an example of coastal sage scrub mapped on the landscape. Next. And then you can see what the integrity class is. And this is a very early draft. Not everything's drawn on here, but you can look at it and see areas that are in high, low, or moderate integrity. Next. And so a high integrity 
shown here is an area where it's a pretty intact landscape. There's a lot of shrub cover and not a lot of invasive grasses as seen through the satellite imagery and um, uh, modeling with that. Next. And here's an area that is a little bit more disturbed. It's intermediate integrity, so it still has shrubs, but the grass component is increasing. Next. And then here is an area that this could have been taken right after a fire or could be an area that has converted into um, a really low integrity environment as depicted by this uh, picture, which is what was once a native shrubland is now dominated by these invasive non-native grasses. And so it really loses the functional value of being able to support species that are dependent on the shrublands like the coastal California gnat catcher and cactus wren. Next. And that's it for today. I thank you for listening to us. And again, I just wanna say it's, it's really great to come to this workshop and see all the um, wonderful things that our partners are doing. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Heidi Van, Bl Van Bloom from the City of San Diego Planning Department. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. And thank you to everybody um, that has showed up today and participated in our annual workshop. Um, I know it's a different type of workshop, but it's um, kind of um, exciting because it opens up the opportunity for more people to be able to participate and learn um, what all our presenters have to share. So um, with that, I also want to thank all the presenters for sharing your juris uh, jurisdiction and agency's efforts. Um, this MSCP was in, is, it, is in its 22nd year in 2019, and now we're moving into the 23rd year of its implementation. We've learned a lot, and we look forward to continuing to fostering relationships with everybody in this group, as well as um, any of the members of the public that has joined us as well. Um, as everybody knows, these are really unprecedented times. Um, and although the pandemic has affected us in many ways, um, our plants and animals um, continue to need um, the protections um, that everybody in this group has been working on. Um, your efforts to continue the restoration, preservation, and sustainability of our, na our natural resources uh, will be appreciated um, by the plants and animals and for many generations to come. You are really preserving our future, everybody that's um, participated in this workshop. Again, I would like to thank our City of San Diego staff for organizing and producing this year's workshop. Um, I wanna give a very special shout out to my staff um, who are just absolutely wonderful to work with, um, with a special thanks to Tara Ash Reynolds for taking the lead on the logistical coordination of this workshop. Um, and of course, to Christy Forberger and Dan Monroe for their daily commitment to the city's MSCP implementation. Please remember that if you have any questions for our presenters, please send them to Tara with the specific presentation and presenter's name um, for which you have a question. Tara will forward these questions on to the appropriate person um, to provide a response to you. Our hope um, is that uh, we can be back together in person next year um, and visiting another MSCP success in the field together. Um, in the meantime, please everybody stay safe, healthy, and happy. Um, take care everyone. Um, and please feel free to contact us through Tara if you have any questions. Thank you everybody for joining our workshop.